Uh, Monica is going to read your CV in Portuguese, and then we will go on with your uh, presentation. Luciana, do you want me to pass your slides? No, I will control my slides. Perfect. Eh, voy a pedir un favor para los señores. Cuando comience la palestra del profesor Durante, todos nos fijar nuestras cámaras y nuestros micrófonos. Okay? Mónica, por favor. Agora a gente tem a honra de apresentar a nossa palestrante, diretamente da Itália, em Roma e do Canadá, a professora Luciana Durante. A professora a doutora Luciana Durante é graduada pela Universidade Sapienza de Roma, na Itália, e antes de se mudar para o Canadá, foi arquivista nos arquivos do Estado de Roma e pesquisadora de arquivos em tempo integral na Universidade Sapienza de Roma. Desde 87, é professora de teoria arquivística, diplomática e preservação de registros digitais no programa de pós-graduação em arquivologia, mestrado e doutorado da Escola de Informação da Universidade de British Columbia, em Vancouver, no Canadá. Também é diretora do Centro de Estudos Internacionais de Arquivos e Registros Contemporâneos e pesquisadora principal e diretora do projeto de pesquisa Interpares, que desde 1998 desenvolve teoria e métodos para a criação, manutenção e preservação de registros digitais confiáveis em todas as tecnologias. A professora Durante tem publicado extensivamente sobre o uso de conceitos de arquivamento e diplomática para a compreensão dos produtos das novas tecnologias e sua relação com a autenticidade dos registros digitais e a confiabilidade dos sistemas digitais, tanto internos quanto online. Agora com vocês, a professora Lutiana Durante, cuja palestra será em inglês. É, todavia, a gente enviou uma cópia traduzida da palestra é, em português para todos aqueles que se inscreveram no evento. As perguntas podem ser formuladas via chat do Google Meet, é, bem como no YouTube. Serão coletadas em ordem é, para serem respondidas pela professora Durante até onde for possível, devido à brevidade do tempo. So now, uh, Professor Durante, thank you so much again for, have, for being here with us. And please feel free to, strike, to start. Thank you very much for your introduction. Um, well, hello everybody. Uh, dear students, professors, administrators, I would like to start by congratulating you on this 10th anniversary and by wishing you a very fulfilling and exciting new academic year. When I was invited to deliver this opening lecture, I was asked to talk about the choices that I made, which contributed to build my career. So this is a very personal story. And to compare them to the choices that you will be confronted with when entering the archival profession. Unfortunately, I do not speak your language, so I will speak English. Uh, but note that in this talk, I will use the terms document and record interchangeably to refer to any document made or received in the course of activity and kept for action or reference. So now I will open my PowerPoint. Um, wait. Oops, what is it? Do you have at the bottom of your screen? You have like four icons, five icons. The last one is the telephone, the red telephone. Then okay. you have a uh, three dots. Then you have like a like a square with an arrow. You point there, you click there. Oh, I already did. I did all the things that I did during the rehearsal and it worked perfectly well. So now let me start again. Okay. So Over. I will go to the thing with the arrow. I have to click on a window. Do and we I have three possibilities. 
You will okay. have a full okay. screen, one specific. Wait there. Uh, I know what the problem is. I know exactly what the problem is. Just a second. Okay. Now I am coming back. Now I am doing this. A window. You see, now I have it. Share. If you have, if you have the PowerPoint open in presentation, you got to search for it. Okay. No, no, I'm fine. Okay. Can you see Perfect. it? Perfect. Okay. Excellent. So, I was asked to say why I became an archivist and why will you become an archivist or should you become an archivist? You, the students, of course, the primary public I am addressing today is the students. So I decided to start with actually those phrases that are stuck in my memory and shaped me. Uh, when I went to the professor, who was my supervisor for my thesis in the history degree, Professor Emilia Morelli, and I said, I would like to continue graduate studies in history. She said, you are too brilliant to be an historian. And then she explained it. Historians discover the sources of the past and interpret them. Archivists acquire and preserve the documentary sources to be discovered and enable the people to access and understand them. So I started the archival program and the uh, uh, chair of the program, the director, was Professor Leopoldo Sandri, who in 1950 used to be the National Archivist of Italy and he gave the very first address to the International Council on Archives. In that address, he said, the sources of history are protected in the office creating them. So when he started teaching us, the first thing he said was, your work is not just preserving what exists, but ensuring that documentary evidence of actions and events will exist. So I graduated and then I won the national competition for a state archivist and I went to work as a state archivist in the State Archives of Rome. The director of the State Archives of Rome at the time was Professor Elio Lodolini. I started there in 1978. The first day of work, he called me in his office and he said, if I catch you reading the documents, you are in big trouble. What did he mean? Well, he meant to say, you are educated as an archivist. You don't need to read the documents to identify them at first glance because you should be able to do so on the basis of your understanding of the form of documents, of the type of script, of the watermarks, of anything that is external to the record and is not its content. In the meanwhile, the principles that were really instilled in me, both my education and by exercise in the profession were in fact the ones articulated by Sir Hilary Jenkinson in 1948. He stated that the archivist must be objective, which means not follow his or her own interest, must be impartial, that is, not serve a party over another, and must be professional, that is, must follow established theory and methods. So why did I actually give in? Why did I accept the suggestion of my professor and then continued on that career? Well, I wanted to be in a service profession. I understood that documents are the most reliable sources of facts and actions because they are created as a means for carrying out activity. So they're not the purpose of such activity. They are an instrument. They are a byproduct. And because of this reason, they're natural because they are not the intended outcome of an action. 
they are authentic with respect to makes to the person or office that makes or receives them. Why? Even if a document is a forgery, if the office that, may, that receives it believes it to be true and uses it in the usual and ordinary course of business, that document is authentic with respect to such business. So you see, all archival documents are authentic and archivists are supposed to keep them so. They are interrelated to all the documents participating in the same activity. They are impartial with respect to the questions asked by future researchers. Of course, the content of every record is partial because it is the point of view of the creator. But at the same time, it is not trying to answer the questions that researchers in the future will ask. And that's why they are the most trustworthy source. They are also unique in that identical documents in different contexts have a different meaning. So the reason why I say this is that what I wanted to be was the guardian of documentary evidence, which means ensuring that these characteristics that I just listed are permanently preserved and that future generations will be able to hold the past accountable for its actions by making the archival material accessible in context. And then I moved to Canada. So there I was. I was a professor at the University of Rome. I taught all the traditional courses that are taught in archival science. And when I moved to Canada, the department head said, asked me, what do you want to teach? And I said, well, the usual arrangement and description, access and retrieval, preservation, history of archives, whatever. And the department head said, this is what you will teach. Records management, diplomatics, appraisal for selection and acquisition. And I said, but I do not know really how to teach these things. And then it all came back to me, the why I was in the archival profession. You remember the words of Professor Sandri? The sources of history are protected in the office of creation. How to create the right records at the right time in the right way and how to keep them so that they can be used as evidence that's what records management is. And then protecting the characteristics of the records, that's what I wanted to do. Authenticity among them, assessing the identity and integrity of the records over time. And what's that? Diplomatics. Holding the past accountable for its actions. Appraisal will determine that, what we select for the future, what we decide to keep for the future to scrutinize the past. So this was indeed what I had prepared myself for, and I understood it for the first time when I was asked to teach those things. But then digital records happened. You know, in the archival field, nothing stays still because archives are part of life. They're part of everyday life, of everybody's life. So I asked myself, is all I prepared for still valid in the digital environment? How can I ensure the creation and maintenance of accurate, reliable and authentic records? when it is so easy to manipulate and to lose them. So I decided to start my very first research project on reliable record keeping, which was funded by the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada. About a month later, three guys show up in uniform from the US Department of Defense and they were from the Navy and the Army and the Air Force. And I said, we need you to help us to design a record-making, a record-keeping system that we can trust. 
And I said, no, I'm not working with anybody. I got my money to do my theoretical research. I don't want to build anything. And they answered, well, you understand, we want your, to demonstrate that your theoretical research works in real life. If you tell us what to do, we can do everything. Well, that bought me. So I did. And together, we examined a digital material on the basis of diplomatics and archival theory. And at the same time, they modeled the ideal system of record making and record keeping based on that theory. The outcome was the Department of Defense 5015.2 standard for record keeping, which was issued in 1997 and is still today the US federal standard for all the federal offices. And it is also the foundation of the ISO standard of record keeping and of all world standard. So just the way I was taught, you remember, the sources of history are protecting the office of creation. Archivists allow for governments to be held accountable. Now though, what about preservation? So I knew that the archival mission only starts in the office of creation. We still need to preserve the digital material forever to enable future generations to hold the past accountable for the world that the future will inherit. Think of climate change. The future has inherited the world for which past governments must be held accountable. Only archivists have the knowledge to determine the requirements of a preservation system. Only archivists have the trust for doing so. Would people trust governments to determine how the documentary evidence of their actions is going to be preserved? Would people trust corporations? No. Only archivists have the ability to join together in a common international effort to develop something that serves the people, all the people, regardless of culture, political regime, religious belief, or traditions. Because archivists are in a central position between the records creators and the users, and between the past and the future. So archival research was not really the reason why I joined the archival profession. But it became clear to me that research by archivists on archival issues was sorely needed. There were many publications by archivists, but none was grounded on original research based on archival theory. Thus, in 1998, I created an archival research world network where none existed before. And archivists across the continent joined together inter pares among peers with nobody controlling them working all as equal contributing their own knowledge to develop new knowledge ensuring that digital records could be not only totally created reliable and accurate but also preserved authentic for as long as needed by the creator and by society at large this Interpares project then used the acronym International Inter Permanent Authentic Records in Electronic Systems. And it is now in its fifth phase, continually funded since 1998 by the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada. Through the Interpares project later, uh, other projects I developed, such as the Digital Records Forensics and Records in the Cloud, we have continued to create new archival knowledge. Not me, all of us together. In this last project I concluded a year ago, there were 42 countries involved, including strongly Brazil. In this new project, 
that started in June and will continue till 2027. Brazil is also a strong participant. We were 500 people in the previous project. We are heading that way also in this present project. Archivists through the Interpares project have also uh, taken concepts and technologies developed by institutions like NASA, that is by non-archivists for non-archivists, and taken technology developed by corporations like Ethereum, the blockchain, and transformed them for archival purposes. So that was what I did. So why will you become an archivist? I imagine that you registered for this program because you like history, maybe, because you want to serve society, because you are excited by emerging technologies, because you wish to manage information and data, because you want to be a steward of the truth, or because you have interest in some types of records. Felix Hall, in 1978, wrote, how dangerous a world is interest. As an archivist, I should not have interests, for I must be all things to all archives, irrespective of age or provenance. In addition, the archivist is a jack of all trades, Hilary Jenkinson wrote. So why should you really become an archivist? Why it is important that we have large, strong cohorts of archivists? Well, think of the digital environment. Archives are the infrastructure through which facts, beliefs, and values are upheld and understood, and by which human institutions are supported. We trust archives implicitly. However, in the digital environment, it is not enough that the custodian is to be trusted. Questions are constantly raised about the trustworthiness of individual records. That is, their reliability, the trustworthiness of their content, their accuracy, the correctness of their data, and authenticity, the identity and integrity of digital records. This is because digital archives are vulnerable. They are easy to destroy, to lose, to corrupt, to tamper with, or to become inaccessible if not protected. Yet they are persistent. They are forever there if you do not destroy them purposefully. And this is equally dangerous because especially personal data should not be hanging around in the cloud somewhere. But the thing is, it is much easier to destroy links than to destroy the actual records. And the most important reason is that it is not possible to preserve born digital records. We can only preserve the ability to reproduce and recreate them over and over again. So because of this difficulty, because every record we have is green, which means is new, is a copy of a copy of a copy. Every time I open a record, I am creating a copy. You cannot authenticate a record on its face. You actually cannot prove anything. So technologists thought, oh, well, we will do it technologically. The industry came up with solutions like digital signatures, blockchain, trusted record keeping systems. So let's start with the digital signature. What does it do? It protects the integrity of the bits. It verifies the origin of a record, which is only a part of the identity of a record. It makes the record indisputable and incontestable. That is, if somebody sends me a digital signed 
record, this somebody cannot deny of having sent it. The digital signature has been given legal value by legislative acts or regulatory bodies, is enabled through complex and costly public key infrastructures, it ensures the authenticity of records across space. That is, when they are transmitted from one person to another, from an organization to another, but not through time, because the digital signature is subject to obsolescence and compounds the problem of preservation because it cannot be migrated with the record to which it is attached. You remember to preserve the record, you start, you have to keep moving yet to the new technology. You need to be updating the system in which the record is. Well, you can't do it with records to which a digital signature is attached. Furthermore, the certificate of authenticity guaranteed through the through the digital signature have an expiration date, which is usually five years, and then the digital signatures are no longer valid. What about blockchain? Well, blockchain is the technology that enables Bitcoin. It is a ledger, that is an information store that keeps a final and definitive trace of transaction. That is, is immutable. You can't change any bit ever. You cannot delete anything. But the fact is that there are no records there. You understand? There is the hash of the record, which is an algorithm that represents the record. The record is somewhere else, in a dark repository, in an in-house repository. Blockchain relies upon a distributed network, which means that all servers are equal. And therefore, there is a decentralized consensus on which records are trustworthy. So this means that there is no single point of control and therefore there is no single point of attack. It is very hard to destroy any part of the blockchain because it is reproduced in all the servers. So these traces of records, which are confirmed and validated, are held in blocks. These blocks are linked in a chain. So the, the, the block that follows the original block contains the hash of the previous block, in addition to the hash of new records. The following block will contain the hash of the previous block, in addition to new records, and so on. So this chain of blocks cannot be tampered with and you can only add to it. Now, what are the problems? Well, the problem is that you could not, cannot prove, you cannot prove that the record was authentic when the ash was taken to start with. So I only know that nothing has changed since I took the ash and put it on the blockchain. But how do I know that the record was authentic before then? Furthermore, the blockchain cannot preserve contextual evidence. That is, you know, the characteristic of the records, the naturalness of the records, the interrelatedness of the records, the relationship between the previous record and the following one. Well, this is not possible because the traces of records are uploaded on the blockchain individually, one by one, and they are in order of time of upload. So if many organizations upload at the same time, it's mixed up with the traces of the records of other organizations. And, you, and it cannot handle the decentralized nature uh, of these servers being distributed everywhere. That means that they are trans-jurisdictional, that is, different laws and different disciplines govern what is in there. And you would not re really know in absolute terms who is the creator, who is the author, who is the owner, what law applies in any given case. So blockchain is not a good idea. Digital signature is not a good idea. What is a better idea? Well, 
system integrity and security comes into play in some jurisdictions, such as Canada, where authentication is based on an inference, on a deduction that we make from the technological environment in which the record is. In other words, we can deduce the identity and integrity of a record from the system integrity. If nobody has tampered with the system, then I deduce that what is inside is also not tampered with. Uh, so how do we know that the system is intact? Well, we would know the requirements on access, that is, who has access privilege to the system, who can actually can use the individual records, how management functions and whose responsibility it is. This, of course, implies strict policies and procedures uh, that control all the records in the system, but also that control any interaction with the records within the systems and from outside. So even if all these technologies worked, we have got a big problem. And the problem is that recently organizations and individuals are entrusting records to cloud providers. Now, we cannot verify the integrity of the servers where the digital material is stored when they are in the data centers of cloud providers. And we cannot verify the requirements of the system that manage the record. All we can do is to examine the security measures with which we agreed in a contract between the provider and the archives and make an inference of authenticity from those. However, archivists can still determine authenticity of individual records on the basis of the significant properties of the records. That is, the attributes necessary to establish the identity and integrity of the records through time, which we find in the metadata attached to the records and in logs, the audit logs and the transactions logs. So archivists are still in control, right? Or are they? Well, the archival community holds public trust for the management and the preservation of the records through which governments are held accountable by the people they serve, that is, by the current and future generations. Now, with the advent of the digital environment, the records have become ubiquitous. There are an infinite number of copies of each record anywhere. So they are easier to access for anybody, also badly intended person. Because of this, and as a consequence of freedom of information laws, records creators have become aware of their records in a supremely self-conscious manner. They have figured that the record should not be left for others or for chance to determine their future. They are too significant politically, legally, and socially. And the time for accountability through them could come any moment, here and now, four days from now, 30 years from now, or 300 years, because historical accountability will eventually come. Thus, the records have lost their innocence, and sometimes they are not even created. I was reading today about um, a discovery made um, by uh, the New York Times uh, that the many of the agreements between the Americans and the Taliban in Doha were written on sticky notes, paper, passed by the one to the other, read, uh, signed, and then may disappear um, so that they wouldn't stay on record. This is exactly what the government of British Columbia was doing. If you want to see this, Interpares Trust, the fourth phase, produced a documentary called The Duty to Document, and there there is the link 
on these slides and you could see exactly what was all, all happening in a government in Canada which is highly trusted and even so the fear of being scrutinized by the governments is really strong archivists must be watchful so the more it changes the more it is to say you should become an archivist because you remember the sources of history are protected in the office creating them and the third party who has no stake in the content of the records must ensure that documentary evidence of actions and events will exist for future generation and this third party is the archivist you should become an archivist because Trustworthy archives rely on objective and impartial professionals educated in the concepts and principles of archival science. You should become an archivist because emerging technologies must be assessed or developed, implemented and controlled by archival professionals who have a deep understanding of the nature of archives. You should become an archivist because the digital environment needs professionals capable of conducting original research based on archival and diplomatic theory. And also because artificial intelligence is coming. Artificial intelligence systems are computing systems using algorithms capable of carrying out complex tasks that were once believed to be the sole domain of natural intelligence. However, careful. Artificial intelligence systems provide inconclusive evidence based on probabilities. Inscrutable evidence, they're black boxes. There is no transparency, no interpretability. Misguided which is as good as the data that are fed to the, the AI tool. Unfair, biased outcomes, which have this impact on one group of people, of course, because the artificial intelligence learns from us and we transfer to artificial intelligence all of our biases. It has transformative effects on the autonomy and privacy of people and it has no traceability it is hard to assign responsibility for the actions taken by artificial intelligence archivists are in a central position between records creators and the users and between the past and the future remember archivists are in a central position between the records creators and the users and between the past and the future while data and numbers can say what has moral value, not what is socially desirable, and you will. Thank you, and many good wishes on this uh, journey that you are undertaking today. Many thanks, Professor Duranti. Superb presentation. And uh, now 